Hi, I'm Allie Hamilton, and I'm so happy to welcome you to the Come As You Are podcast. Every week, we'll be talking about some aspect of healing, usually around childhood wounds and complicated familial relationships. The topics will always coincide with my personal essay of the week, and this will be a place where we can take a deep dive together. I'm so thrilled you've joined me and delighted for you to always come as you are. Hi there. Hi there. Welcome to our talk. The topic this week is how to break a spell, and it is all about the difference between loving people and trying to save them. And sometimes that line can get a little too fuzzy. And if you've ever tried to save someone or you have that sort of savior complex thing where you think you're gonna be able to come in and save the day or you find yourself drawn in um, when someone is hurting, it's a really good boundary to uh, get clear on. And I know this from <laughs> personal experience. And I was writing this week about this tendency that I had even when I was really little. And, you know, it's not, <laughs> it probably wasn't like an innate tendency. I think it's something that sometimes you're assigned a role in your family of origin and in my family of origin which ended up splitting my sort of my family of origin became two households when my parents divorced but at both households the the kind of appointed role was peacekeeper caretaker you know um person who was supposed to somehow like help and make everything okay and you know when you're tiny and that's the assignment it's not a choice it's just what you are what you're being asked to do and so we're all learning when we're you know when we're children right we're like sponges and we are learning from the things that are actually being communicated to us but we're also learning by those nonverbal cues and responsibilities and expectations and so with my dad as soon as my parents split um, he started talking to me about his very grown-up problems and I've written about this a lot and I've talked about it a lot but the the sort of really short version of the story is my dad was I mean just a womanizer of like Olympic you know levels like he just um yeah, he just, he, he chased after a lot of women and he hurt a lot of women um, and he hurt all of his children. He had two kids from his first marriage, my half brother and sister, who I really didn't have much of a relationship with at all as I was growing up. They were, that was his first wife and he had an affair with my mother when his kids were 14 and 16. And he ended up leaving his family and marrying my mother. And my parents were together for four years. And then they had me. Um, and then as soon as my mom was pregnant with me, my dad started seeking out other women. Um, and my mom, you know, discovered this when I was a baby. And it just reeked. I mean, it was the beginning of the end of their marriage. And then he moved in with the woman who became my stepmom and continued to be in a committed relationship and see multiple women all the time on the side. And then eventually he got married for a fourth time. So this was sort of like a lifelong thing that was going on with him. And, um, and he would talk to me and he would cry and I was four, you know? So seeing your dad cry is a scary thing. And if you are a child, you know, most children have a lot of empathy. And if you see someone crying, you want to help. You know, it's natural to us. And there's something called mirror neurons. Like, we all have them. And it's the thing that if you're watching a film and you start crying because you're, 
you know, you're relating to a character who's going through something heartbreaking, or if you're like me, <laughs> and it really doesn't take much at all, like a commercial might do it, or someone singing a song in a really soulful way, or um, any small act of kindness might elicit tears or some kind of response inside of you that is strong because you're recognizing the humanity in someone else. We're wired for that. And you can, you know, if you don't, if you're not familiar with mirror neurons, you can look that up. It's fascinating. Um, so I really do think that we are physiologically wired to care about each other, which would be a good positive thing for evolution, right? Like caring about the tribe and caring about the people that are with you. And, you know, um, if someone is hurting, then you're feeling that pain and you want to do something to alleviate the suffering. So what happens for a lot of people is they head out into the world and they get hurt and hardened. Um, and I think that those mirror neurons can be, you know, kind of, uh, other things, other tendencies, like self-protection can override the tendency toward compassion and empathy. Because if you get hurt enough, you know, you're going to want to protect yourself and be a little less vulnerable when you're out in the world. So if you're four, you know, chances are, and this is not for everyone, but most four-year-olds have not hardened yet. Um, unless there's extreme neglect or abuse, which is just heartbreaking in and of itself. But with my dad, you know, my, my heart broke for him because here you see this grown man, your dad crying, sobbing in your arms and talking about, you know, this need to be free and all these women who wanted him to commit and he couldn't do it. And I mean, I really thought as a child that my poor dad was the victim of all of these, you know, awful women who wouldn't share him. And that was the narrative that I was like, you know, marinating in as I was growing. And that really didn't stop until I was like 13. Uh, and then I started to be old enough to look around and see, well, wait a second, <laughs> I don't actually think you're the victim of this situation. I think you're the perpetrator. And I think a lot of women are angry with you because you keep making promises and then you break them. You know, this is not a, it's not really that difficult to figure out here. Um, and then I became enraged because I had spent my childhood trying to help him and not being able to relate to the other kids my age because my head was full of all these adult problems. And I was so... I really took on this role of being his primary caretaker to the degree that when I was at my mom's for three or four days in a row, I'd be worried that he wouldn't be okay. And I remember as a kid worrying like, you know, it wasn't completely logical, but I'd worry that he might break an arm or a leg. Like I was worried about his physical well-being and I was also worried about his emotional well-being and if he, you know, what, what he would, was he going to be okay without me for a few days? So those are not, you know, that's not what you want. As a parent, you do not want your tiny child worrying about whether you're okay if they're not around. That's not the way the roles are supposed to work. But that's what I grew up understanding. At my mom's, it was different. Um, she, you know, instantly became a single mom and my dad was not reliable financially. So I think my mom was under a tremendous amount of stress just keeping a roof over our heads and trying to figure out how we were going to be okay. And this is, you know, in the seventies and she got a job doing the same thing she'd been doing when she met my dad. She was a secretary at a publishing company and she started dating. You know, I think she was looking for her next husband because in her mind at that time, that was the best way for us to have security and safety was for her to find a husband. And my mother was extremely you know, just beautiful and she was out all the time. Um, and so when I had her, it felt like such a 
like I'd won the lottery, you know, like when I got to actually spend time with her. And a lot of the time she was exhausted from, I think, all the stress. Um, so those that was the environment I was growing in. So my kind of wiring was set to help, you know, to be looking for places where I could step in and try to make things better. Eventually, my mom started drinking, and that happened when I was around seven, eight, um, is when I have very clear memories of that beginning and drinking to the point where her personality would change and she would become enraged and sometimes violent. It was very scary. And so then I started to try to apply that same sense of like, how do I make this better for her? And how do I also keep myself safe? And how do I read the room and read her moods and figure out if I can do something to turn things around if I can see things going in a direction that you know doesn't seem good um how can I you know how can I keep the peace here and make things okay and so when that is kind of like what is and a lot of people by the way I wrote the essay and I got so many comments and emails and you know messages from people who relate being parentified as a child is very common, you know? And I think that the conversation around that has become more, it's like in the mainstream. And I, I do think that more people understand that's not what you do as a parent. You know, you don't start burdening your children with your adult problems. But this is the 70s, you know, that I was growing up. And um, I don't think that those conversations were really out there just yet. And I think also... I knew as a child a lot of the things happening with my dad were secret. You know, he was spending time with women. My stepmother wasn't supposed to know this was a secret. So, and I certainly never talked to my mother about what was happening at my dad's. Um, so that lens, right, of like looking looking out at the world and trying to figure out who needs help or what, that, that just becomes ingrained. That becomes a way of being. Now, you know, you may have had other things that happened along the way, but this tendency to um, try, you know, that broken bird syndrome is strong for a lot, for a lot of people. And it did sort of seep into everything. And so I was that kid that like I was writing about, I remember being in the window seat in our living room at my mom's and it was my favorite place to read. I would kind of curl up on the window seat and bring blankets and a book and sit in the window and spend hours there. And one day I was there and I saw a sparrow just fall from the sky and land on the sidewalk outside the building. And I went, you know, running I grabbed a shoebox and a little like soft rag and I went downstairs and our neighbor across the street helped me lift this little sparrow into the shoebox and the it, one of its wings was broken and um, my mom let me like nurse it back to health and then obviously I set it free and that became a thing you know I would bring home stray everything kittens like you know there was a um, eventually when I was the Christmas I was about to be eight um, my mom and stepdad brought a dog home from the ASPCA and she had been abused and um, she would she was amazing she was so smart and loving and just I mean the best just the best dog and the best companion but whenever the bell would ring she would squat and pee you know and whenever strangers would come in she would squat and pee and like I I will never know what happened um I went to my dad's for a weekend and when I came back the dog was gone and my mom said she had run away and you know I don't know I mean I as I got older I wondered if she ran away or if you know, she was brought back to the ASPCA because of the squatting and peeing. But um, but that tendency to try to, like, save and to fix and to help was really strong. And so I was writing about walking home from fourth grade one day. I was nine, and I walked by the courtyard of a building that I always walked by when I was heading back to my mom's. And this is a time, you know, might sound wild to people today because I feel like there's so much – certainly my own children even like 
growing up in a safe neighborhood, I they were not walking to and from school at eight, you know. But when I was growing up in New York City, it was really common back in this is like, you know, I was born in 1971. So um, this is like 78, 79, 80. This was a really common occurrence with me and a lot of the kids I went to school with as we were taking public transportation, packing our own lunches. You know, you hear all these and you see memes and stuff from from my generation of people who's like, you know, listen, we would let ourselves in and like back into our apartments at the end of the day and do our own laundry and we'd pack our own lunches and we'd talk to Mr. Rogers, you know, like and our parents were working and that's just how it went. And it does make you self-sufficient in many ways, but there are also a lot of things that happened. Um, I got mugged multiple times and grabbed, and you know there were some things that happened due to just being on my own in New York City. So there are like upsides and downsides, but that was the environment at the time. And I was walking home, and I saw this group of kids, and in the center of this huddle it was probably a dozen kids there was a tall kid and he had like a broomstick and he was like stabbing it down and all the kids were yelling like get it get it and I I don't know what I just walked over to see what was happening which was not something I would have done normally because I was very shy as much as I you know that was another sort of thing like if I got called on in class I was the kid whose voice shook just from reading and that's in a room full of kids I knew so to go into a you know group of kids and get loud was certainly out of character but that's what happened I like got up to the front of the circle and there was a bucket and a tiny mouse inside this bucket and the kid was trying to kill it with the end of the broomstick and it was covered in this white powder I didn't know what that was at first it turned out it was bleach but um, I was so devastated like I saw this just tiny mouse running in circles and you could just see it's like heart beating in its entire tiny little body and its eyes were wild and I mean it was just awful you know I was like looking up and and scrambling around in there and I just you know yelled without even realizing that I was yelling like hey what are you doing and everyone froze and the kid stopped you know and he looked at me and he said, I'm, I'm trying to kill it. You know, like it was just, of, of course that's what I'm doing, you know? And I said, why? And I got extremely emotional, you know, trying not to cry. And he said, I don't know. And then he asked me if I wanted it. And I said, yes. And so the kids all dispersed. He handed me the bucket. Um, I asked him what the powder was he said it was bleach and I walked back to my mom's with this mouse in a bucket and I was just talking to the mouse and telling it you know it was going to be okay and all of that um and so I was writing about this the difference between trying to save people and loving them and it really is such an important distinction because in that instance you know both with the sparrow and the mouse I was able to do something you know I was able to nurse the sparrow back to health and set it free and I was able to take that mouse to the vet and get it cleaned cleaned up and cleaned I'm sure the vet was like this little kid is trying to save a tiny mouse there were like a million probably eight million mice in New York City but anyway they did they were they were very wonderful about it and I took the mouse and I set it free in Riverside Park um but when it comes to people it doesn't work like that you know it's like it would be nice if caring could save someone but if you've been in that situation you know that that is not that's not how it works and I it took me a really long time to get that lesson, you know, to really, really understand you can't save people. You can love people. You know, you can love somebody with all of your heart and you can be there for them and you can be supportive and you can show up and you can share the tools that have worked for you and your own 
healing process. Um, but you can't do the work for anyone else. It's, it's inside work. Sylvia Borstein is a beautiful meditation teacher, and she has a book called Happiness is an Inside Job. And it's a great book, highly, highly recommend. And, and that is, those are the facts, you know, like happiness is an inside job and liberation, you know, from your own internal demons, whatever they might be, that's an inside job. And that's what I was writing about is the pain of, um, you know, trying to save someone else from their own addiction or their own just crippling self-doubt or their own um, just lack of feeling that they're worthy of love and all the ways that, that that doubt can kind of wreak havoc on someone's life, whether it's addiction or it's, um, you know, fear of intimacy and all the different ways that arises. And I was talking about that a little bit last week thinking that you're going to go in and fix that for someone else is such a trap because no one could fix it for you, right? Like if you just think about that for a minute, if you really believe in your heart that you're broken, and I believed that for a long time, I really thought as I was growing up, I thought that my mother's alcoholism and the way that it manifested and the times that she became enraged with me or, you know, physically terrifying, which were frequent, um, coupled with the fact that she just was not a very, she wasn't affectionate with me and she wasn't one to give a lot of verbal affirmation, praise, you know, um, once in a while, but it was crumbs. I really thought, okay, I'm not lovable. Like there's something broken at my core and the people who get close to me can see that, you know. Now, of course, I was drawn in by people who were in pain. And so, um, because that was like a hook for me if I saw that somebody was suffering. And I don't just mean romantic relationships. I mean friendships, you know, that's just, that was like a hook for me. If I could see someone is suffering, someone is not okay, I'm, I'm going in. <laughs> you know, hold my bag. I'll be right back. I'm going in. And, um, and what would happen is like, I couldn't, no matter how hard I tried or how much I showed up, you know, I realized like you can't save people from their own doubt and from their own pain. And when you really grasp that, it, it's such a relief and it's so helpful with boundaries and with protecting your own well-being Um, when you get really caught up in somebody else's whatever it might be so with my mother it was her addiction and for a long time I did try I was like the lone voice in the equation as I got older I was the one person saying this isn't right and you're not okay like you need help you know it's not if you need to drink almost every night in order to be okay you're not happy like you need there you know something is going on you're needing to numb something pain stress something and there are better ways you know and you're hurting all the people around you and she just was not willing to have that conversation and she had I think very carefully surrounded herself with people who either also drank to excess or were enabling the behavior. And that's generally what you're going to find around someone who is alcoholic and not trying to do anything about it. Um, You know, they're going to surround themselves with people who normalize the behavior. And so that was also like a mind, you know what, I try not to on the podcast because I know sometimes you might be listening with small people around. So, um, you know, that was also a, a thing for me where I was like, okay, I, for me, it seems really clear my, my mother is not okay and she needs help, but every grown up around her is telling me that I'm wrong and she's fine and she's a social drinker and I'm, you know, hypersensitive and it's my perception that's the problem it's not her behavior so that is the gaslighting kind of that happens when you are dealing with someone else's addiction and you're trying to help 
you know, if there isn't a support system there of other people, I mean, that's like intervention is the closest people in the person's life coming together and saying, we love you and we're really scared. Like, you're not okay. I didn't have any of that. There was no intervention possible because (laughs) it was an intervention of one, you know? And what ended up happening is she would become furious with me for not accepting her version of reality. And her version of reality was she was fine and there wasn't a problem. And, you know, for me, I was really suffering because of her drinking. And um, I wanted nothing more than for her to get help so we could be close because I was finding the only way for me to have her in my life was with all of these boundaries, especially as I got older and I began to understand I'm just sucked into the vortex here with her. You know, like I cannot even disentangle myself enough from this situation to figure out who I am outside the context of my mother's alcoholism. Like, who am I, you know, as, a, as my own person? And how can I sort of disentangle and put my feet on solid ground and figure out what's real and what's not real? And that's another thing that happens when you love an addict is that sometimes if there is intense gaslighting, you start to doubt yourself, especially if you're a kid you know, and everyone's telling you, it's not them, it's you. You're like, okay, wow. I mean, the sky looks blue when I look up, but everyone is telling me it's purple. So I, maybe it's me, like, I'm just not seeing things properly. Um, and so that is, that is a byproduct. If you grew up in an environment like that, of just not trusting yourself and not, you know, not relying on your own, um, not considering yourself a reliable narrator, right? And and it's really problematic because then as you're moving through life, you're like, is it me or is this not okay? And I used to start so many conversations in my life like that. I'd be in a relationship with someone, friendship, you know, romantic relationship, familial relationship, whatever the case may be, and some interaction would happen and I would find myself having the same conversation with every person in my life that I trusted you know, who I trusted, like, is it me or is it me? Or is this like, you know, I mean, just anytime there'd be conflict because I didn't trust my own, my own perception. And that was, I mean, years of work to get really clear on, you know what, if I'm seeing something with my own eyes and feeling something in my own heart And my intuition is telling me this and my ears are, you know, I'm hearing it. I can, I can have faith in myself and my ability to discern, you know, what is real and what is not real. And discernment is a big part of the yoga practice, right? Trying to figure out like what's, what is lasting and what is fleeting and what is the reality of the situation that I find myself in. Um, And being able to look at these things and let go of our attachment to how we want something to be and just look at the thing as it is right now. And you know that's such a trap too because you can fall in love with the potential of how something could be with someone if only. Um, but that if only is not real, it's a fantasy. It's not, the reality is like what's actually happening right here, right now between me and this other person. That's what I need to be looking at and dealing with. Um, and so, when you love people who doubt their own worth for whatever reason, it's incredibly painful because you may try to come in there and save the day and you may have your own reasons for that. Like I was writing about, you might be addicted to saving the day, you know, or you might have such a strong identification with that idea of yourself. You know, I'm someone who can help, um, that you're just, you're not seeing clearly. And you might feel so comfortable in the role of being the person who's trying to save someone else or help someone else. And for me, for sure, it felt like home. You know, if somebody needed help, it was like, oh, I know how to do this. I mean, I've been doing this my whole life. I'm it. I've got it. I've got a resume. (laughs) Let me apply for this job. I can be the project manager of your painful situation. Let me just take a look at what you need 
and what's happening for you. And then in response, like what I, the trade for me is you won't leave me. I'm going to come in and I'm going to help so much and make things so much better for you that I then don't have to worry that you might walk out the door because I've made myself indispensable, you know, because that was my own stuff. So this is part of just like understanding what's driving me and what's happening with this, this other person. And that's part of just seeing reality clearly, right? Trying to discern um, what what is happening here and identify like your tendencies, your patterns, your wiring. And if there's stuff that you are, if there are grooves you're repeating, how to pull yourself back from that. And, you know, sometimes like in the beginning when you're trying to do this work and you're trying to shift a very strong tendency it is hard it takes like herculean effort you know to like not repeat the pattern and not allow yourself to get sucked into the vortex um and there may be a point in time like i remember this clearly there was a point in time where i would know i could see it coming like a mile away like oh boy like danger danger you know red flags red flags like this person is hating themselves or they're you know dealing with an addiction or they're not okay in some major major way and you are you're grabbing your bags and you're running toward the (laughs) you're running toward it like you're running toward the rock fall zone you know and I would know that Um, And this is, I think this is part of the process of like shifting is the first part is you're bringing it into your awareness, right? You're able to actually see what you're doing and see what your tendencies are. That doesn't mean you're going to be able to overcome them right away. And so there was a point in my life where I would almost from 10,000 feet up, watch myself getting on the train, knowing that it was going to head toward a brick wall and I was going to be heartbroken at the end and hurt, but doing it anyway. You know, like just watching myself buy the ticket and get on the train with my bags. Like, yep, I'm here. I'm here. I, I'm going to, I brought all my tools to save the day. I know I can't, but I can't seem to not do what I'm doing. So here I am on that. Here I am riding the ride again. Um, and there might be that for you, you know, and you might have to ride the ride like multiple times and crash into the brick wall multiple times before you're like, you know what? I don't want to ride this ride anymore. (laughs) This is not a fun ride. And I don't want to keep buying the ticket. I don't want to keep signing up for this. Um, I also have like my own, you know, tender heart in here that is getting bashed into the wall. And maybe there's another way, you know, maybe I could like walk instead of getting on this train for a while and just try to figure my, you know, myself out, figure my stuff out here. And that's what I did. Um, for me and you know and I think for most people taking a little hiatus and trying to step back and hit the pause button and look at what's driving you um, and get really clear on the fact that you can't save people is huge you know it's no coincidence what I do in my life right I I write whenever I'm writing I'm always trying to share some either you know breakthrough moment in my own like healing process or some idea that's been incredibly comforting to me or helpful or enlightening um what I teach yoga right so when I'm teaching same I'm trying to share the tools that have helped me in rewiring my own system the most um and I there's really nothing I find more gratifying than being able to help someone because I think that it is I think it's amazing to be a human being on planet earth I really do I find it endlessly fascinating but I also think it's really hard and it can be incredibly painful and lonely and scary and confusing and overwhelming and sometimes impossible you know and sometimes being in your own skin is so uncomfortable and being in your own head is so boring after a while you know like same thought same problem same issue you know because we can I mean we've all been there and so I it it is so fulfilling for me 
to write something or to like teach a class or a workshop, you know, and like have somebody come and say, oh, that helped me so much. Like that's just such a great feeling. Um, and I don't want to change that about myself. <laughs> you know, I, I, that's one of the things I most like about myself is that I do want to help, you know, in whatever ways that I can. I do want to because I feel like connection is the best stuff we get here. You know, it's like you got a flash of time. And to me, the best use of that time is to connect and to really like love your heart out and to look around and not lose sight of the fact that you are on a spinning planet in a solar system in a just mind boggling universe, you know, and not to like not to lose sight of that. Um, So I don't want to change that about myself but I also don't want to think I can save anyone you know each one of us we have to save ourselves at a certain point if life is feeling unlivable um, if you find that you are repeating patterns over and over again that end up with you heartbroken and just beside yourself yeah you know you got to kind of reach that moment of enough like enough I can't I can't keep doing this. I've got to change the way I'm thinking about things. That's the first thing you can change. You know, sometimes like before you can change your circumstances, you got to shift the way you're thinking about your circumstances. And there are legitimately really painful things that happen in this world. And people can be incredibly cruel to one another and to themselves. It's like I was that kid with the broomstick and the bucket. You know, I mean, just going after that mouse and he didn't even know why. Like he didn't even know why he was doing what he was doing. Um, I can reflect back as an adult and and recognize that probably that whole group of kids, I mean, he in particular probably felt really powerless in his own life. I don't know what was going on at home or, you know, in his world, but just something about, you know, here's this tiny mouse, like I can... I can do the mouse in, you know, I might not be able to like do anything else, but I can do that. And I think the kids were almost like in a spell, you know, like caught up as like that group think, um, because it wasn't even bystander syndrome. It was a lot of kids like egging it on. And so my guess is that a lot of them felt powerless or felt angry or felt helpless, um, in some way or another. And I think for me, I had the opposite feeling of yelling to, like, what's, why, you know, like, why, like, why would you kill a tiny mouse that didn't do anything to you, you know, in the most violent way, and I think when I yelled, it was like it broke the spell, you know, and that sometimes you can break a spell for people in the sense that you can just, help them see what they're doing to themselves um you can look at your own participation in a situation which doesn't mean that the situation is your fault at all but you can look at like why am I staying let me try to figure that out or what do I need to do in order to leave and it is not a level playing field you know and that is so essential to remember that we're all born into different circumstances and we've got different, you know, advantages and disadvantages and things that we're dealing with. And so that's why it's so dangerous to judge other people or to say, I would never do that. You don't know what you would do if you were that person. You really don't. If you grew up the way that they did and you were born where they were born and the things happened to you that happened to them, you'd be them. I'd be them. You know, it's like we're all a product of the things we've been through, the environment we grew up in, um, the advantages or disadvantages that we had along the way. And I'm not just talking about socioeconomic things. I'm also talking about like the emotional resources that were available to us, the caregivers, you know, you, you, there's everything across the spectrum. You could grow up in a situation where you have all the socioeconomic advantages in the world, but you're dealing with an abusive, you know, neglectful alcoholic I mean there's a lot of things that can happen you know so it's just like or you could have the reverse where you're 
born into poverty, you know, and there are no resources available for you or your caregivers. I mean, so just to understand when you're thinking about these things or you're looking around the world, the more empathy you can extend and the more benefit of the doubt you can give and the more kindness you can offer, the better. And so that it's not like it doesn't help when you love people and you show up for them and you, you know, try to offer a hand or your shoulder or a hug, like all those things can be incredibly helpful, but you still can't save anyone. Everyone has to do that, that work for themselves. I was saying that, you know, you, you, potentially inspire someone to hang on one more day you do that you know just by being kind and I don't think I can overstate the power of just small acts of kindness and I mean really like these things that you might consider just not a big deal might be the thing that keeps somebody holding on you know, you never know the kind of turmoil that's happening inside someone else's head unless they tell you. And just taking a moment to make eye contact as you're going out in the world, you know, to not be on your phone scrolling and missing the fact that there's a human being in front of you who maybe, maybe hasn't had genuine human contact in days, you know, that matters, the kind that really like restores your faith in humanity you know there are people who live alone and are just like holding on by a thread and so the more that you are able to recognize that and try to move from that awareness it absolutely has an impact on the world around you and the people around you it's just that ultimately if someone is really um, dealing with a lot of internal pain they are the only ones who can really decide okay I've got to I've got to change the wiring from the inside here you can't change somebody else's wiring for them and so but you can really exhaust yourself and break your heart trying and so it's a there's a boundary there and there's a um, a line that you that you can walk and sometimes when you are talking about addiction you know, there may be times where you have to step way back and love somebody from afar. And, and it is so hard. You know, I've been there. It's so painful and devastating to be in that situation where you've done anything and everything you can think of to be supportive and to show up and to try to convince and try to make the person see how amazing they are and how special they are, you know, and it's just not working for your own well-being and your own just sanity you know sometimes you've got to step back and love people you know from from afar um and I had to do that with my own mom sometimes and it really hurt like it was awful because all I wanted to do was be close to her but you know when someone's in the throes of like serious addiction or um serious sort of mental health struggles it's like you know, there's only so much you're going to be able to do. And, um, and it's tough, you know, it's painful. And so understanding and really getting clear on the difference between those two things, what does it look like for me to, first of all, let me remember that I've got to take care of my own heart or I can't be helpful to anyone. And so am I, am I doing that, you know, or am I still in this mindset of thinking I'm going to like fix everything for this person, in which case I've got to do some work on boundaries right now. Um, if you've done that work and you feel like, okay, I'm keeping myself as safe as I can emotionally here, I'm still loving this person, but I'm aware of where we are. And I'm aware that if, if they can't get to a place where they recognize that being here is worthwhile, I'm not, I can't, there's, I can't, there's nothing I can do to save them or to fix that. You know, if you feel like you're clear on that line, um, then you're, you know, you're probably in that right, that sweet spot of like, 
I love you. I'm here. I'm not going anywhere, but it's up to you, you know? Like, I, I can only meet you maybe three quarters of the way on the bridge, but you've got to step onto that bridge here, you know, and, and, and walk toward me a little bit. Like, I can't do the whole thing. Um, it's not like, you know, <laughs> I was saying in the essay that, like, sometimes with that bucket you know I didn't just pick up the mouse and put it in my pocket and take it away with me I was scared I was scared of the mouse um so I lifted the entire bucket and walked home with the entire this mouse is at that moment in time the mouse's whole world in my arms you know telling it like it was going to be okay and you can do that for people and it's beautiful but ultimately like the person in the bucket has to like figure out you know okay I don't I don't want to live here. I don't want to live in this, in this pain with the bleach burning my eyes. Like I, I got to find a way to pull myself out and, you know, take advantage of the help that's being offered. Um, so yeah, I hope that this is helpful to you. And, um, you know, that I'm always, I, I always respond to comments and I try to be really easy to find. I do know exactly how hard it is to, love people who are suffering from addiction or, um, you know, dealing with really painful mental health issues and, or really doubting themselves or, you know, just self-esteem stuff. I mean, just all of that. I'm not worthy of love, you know, that, that painful, painful place where people can get to in this world. And it's not so hard to get there. Um, I know how I know how much you end up suffering as well trying to throw a line to someone who doesn't want to isn't ready yet to grab on um, and to be gentle with yourself as well and also to take a look at why is this a hook for me and can I get really clear on the fact that I can't save people I can just love them so I hope this was helpful to you and I look forward to further conversation.